Irony is dead tonight. Donald Trump Jr. killed it. Reacting to the tax-related criminal charges against the family company and the chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, young Master Trump told Fox News, quote, this is what Vladimir Putin does. As for how his father has been taking the news, CNN political analyst and New York Times Washington correspondent Maggie Haberman joins us now with her new reporting. Also, CNN senior legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Ellie Honig. Maggie, first to you. Look, you know, Trump world trying to send off signals. Oh, this is no big deal, the indictments. Oh, it's just a partisan witch hunt. Oh, nothing to see here. What's really going on behind the scenes? What is the real feeling among the president and his close advisors? Look, John, you're going to continue to see the former president describe this as a witch hunt and describe this uh, as a, a partisan investigation. Uh, part of that is going to be because of Cy Vance. Part of that is going to be because of the attorney general, uh, Letitia James, in New York, who is also working on this case with Vance. But in reality, Donald Trump is not somebody who has sought to be indicted. He is not somebody who thought this was a good thing. There was some, some spin from one of his advisors earlier this week about how, or right before the indictment, about how he was, quote unquote, thrilled. He's not thrilled. Uh, you know, I don't think he's throwing staplers, but he's not happy. It's not something that he's talking about constantly as, you know, as fury. But this is not where they want to be. This is a, a totally new world for him, John. And I think that what you've seen with the former president and his advisors and his, uh, members of his family uh, and his allies is they have conflated legal problems with public relations problems for so long that I think some of them are losing sight of the fact this is actually an indictment. Now, it's not an indictment of Donald Trump personally, but it is an indictment of his CFO and of his company. And, and these are, even if they want to dispute the case and whether it's fair and whether it would be brought against somebody else, the reality is that Alan Weisselberg, the CFO, is is facing potential jail time. And that can, can change things. It may not. He has indicated he's not going to cooperate with prosecutors, but we'll see where this goes. What was the indictment, Maggie, part of the former president's regular TV viewing yesterday? Uh, the former president was definitely watching the news coverage. And, and he, one of the things that I think people don't understand about how he watches television is it isn't just glued to the box. He often has it on in the background and then looks up and looks at things. But the TV is off and on, and he was well aware of the coverage yesterday. So, Ellie, from a legal perspective, what happens now? The arraignment has come and gone. What's the goal among the New York prosecutors? Still to get Weisselberg to flip? I think so, absolutely, John. Look, there's one of two things that yesterday's indictment is. Scenario one is this could be prosecutors shooting their shot, putting their best foot forward and hoping they get something out of this. If that's the case, it's really not much. I think what the scenario is, having been a prosecutor for a long time, is they are trying to strategically target leverage and pressure Alan Weisselberg to flip. Whenever you're trying to break into a closed society, a closed organization like the Trump Organization, this is what prosecutors do. You look at the org chart, you say, who might be vulnerable, who actually might flip, and who can deliver the goods? And if you look at that, for the Trump org, everyone in that inner circle, except for Alan Weisselberg, has the last name Trump. They're not going to flip. So I think the prosecutors are putting an awful lot of eggs in the basket of flipping Weisselberg. But as Maggie said, the status quo at the moment is he's not interested. Now, I've seen people who I never expected to flip have a change of heart when they see that indictment and feel those handcuffs. So that, to me, is the biggest thing to watch in this case moving forward. Ellie, I learned today that you literally taught a class on, on flipping witnesses uh, in, when you were in the prosecutor's office. So what's going on behind the scenes? I mean, what are they saying to Weisselberg and his team? How quickly does this happen? Well, I think they said something loud and clear with the indictment yesterday. When I looked at that indictment, I will tell you the evidence against Alan Weisselberg was significantly stronger than I suspected. John, you coined the phrase the smoking spreadsheet, uh, which I think is, is a very clear piece of evidence. Another piece of evidence that jumped off the page to me is they have evidence that Alan Weisselberg tampered with a record. They allege in the indictment that Weisselberg told another unnamed person at the Trump board, take my name off that document. There was a notation that said per Alan Weisselberg. Weisselberg said, get my name off there. That is really incriminating evidence. So if Alan Weisselberg sitting there with his attorneys today, I think his attorneys have to tell him, look, they have a strong case against mm -hmm. you. You're about to turn 74 years old, Alan. And if you get convicted here, you could go away for several years. So you need to let that sit for a bit as a prosecutor. But that indictment sent a message yesterday. You know, Maggie, I think people forget sometimes that the Trump Organization is a family business, a relatively small in some ways family business, right. a family business now under indictment. And, and you're one of the reporters, you, know, you have a byline on a story, which I think is really interesting in The Times, which talks about how this indictment could affect 
the family business almost immediately. Uh, what will the impact be? So, John, the, the biggest question right now is what this means in terms of the Trump Organization's relationship with its lenders in, in various areas, whether that is uh, lenders on specific properties, whether that is uh, lender, lenders in, in, uh, that you know, we're not aware of, frankly. But oftentimes, there are covenants that are agreed to between lenders and a, com and a company or an organization uh, as to a specific project or as to an amount of, uh, of capital that is being given to the company. Some of those covenants suggest that there could be, and I'm not saying that's the case here, I'm saying this is just what happens, is that there, there can be uh, situations created in these covenants where the lenders would have the ability, banks, for instance, would have the ability to walk away. Now, Donald Trump has had a very charmed life in terms of this. He has generally, even when people thought banks would walk away from him, even when banks themselves suffered, he has still always managed to find a way, so we will see. But, but that would be the biggest way in which you could see some impact. Um, Ellie Honig, let's role play here. Uh, Ellie Honig for the defense. If, if you're Alan Weisselberg's lawyer, <laughs> what are you telling him today? Uh, the first thing I'm telling him is they've got a good case against you. You really ought to think about cooperating. I mean, look, any person who's been charged with an indictment has three options. Number one, you can cooperate. If you do that, given the nature of the charges here, you have a very good chance to get probation, to not go to jail. Option two is you can just plead guilty without cooperating, without helping them out. If you do that, Mr. Weisselberg, you have a chance to get maybe a year or two, if you look at the New York guidelines, two or three years, but maybe I, your defense lawyer, can argue to the judge for probation. We'd have to, we'd be rolling the dice. Option three is you can go to trial. I think anyone who advises a client has to tell them that most defendants, it varies a bit by jurisdiction, get convicted at trial. And if you get convicted at trial, you very likely will get sentenced to several years in prison. So those are the three options that Alan Weisselberg's sitting with. And one other thing that's important, building off what Maggie just said, the money matters a lot. The two scenarios where I've seen people cooperate the most are one, of course, to avoid or minimize jail time, but two, when that money runs out, when the money to fight the cases, when the money to pay the lawyers, when the money to maintain the rich lifestyles runs out, that's when people flip as well. So that's a factor that's playing into all of this. Maggie, very quickly, because we got to run here, but. What is the former president more focused on at this point, politics or business? I don't know how you separate them, John. I mean, I think that uh, the, the, the politics gives him uh, some sense of a shield uh, to say that this is a political witch hunt. I mean, I think he would say it anyway. And the politics allow him to keep raising money. The second that he says that he's not running for president again, he is not able to raise money anymore. So I think they are, they are intertwined. And frankly, John, that has often been a problem for him is that they're always intertwined, the politics and the business. That's not the issue with this case, to be very, very clear. Um, but that has been a question that has dogged him uh, since he first ran for office. I knew you were going to go for option C there. I just knew it. All right, Maggie Haver and Ellie Honig, uh, our thanks to both of you. Uh, have a great weekend. Happy birthday, America, as we'd like to say. Thanks, John. Thanks, Maggie.